All right, everyone, go ahead and grab your seats. Uh, thank you again for joining us tonight. You're catching us in week two of a series through the book of Jonah. If you were here last week, uh, my trusted friend and colleague, Phil Owen, was here to kick off the series. Uh, really appreciated that he was here while I was out of town. He said a lot of really important things. If you missed it, um, you should definitely check out our website. You can find our podcast there at tsgeng.org slash sermons. You'll find his uh, audio recording there. Um, Phil did a great job. I listened to it a couple times, and I really appreciated what he had to say. There were some things that he said that I took a few of you off guard, some things that were controversial, some things that some of you disagreed with. Um, and then he said a whole lot of stuff that I think most of you would agree with and would really enjoy. So I would encourage you to um, hopefully not miss the forest for the trees and see um, all of what Phil said, hear all of what Phil said, if you can. Um, I appreciate that we're a part of a family of churches where there can be disagreement. I appreciate that we're a part of a community where we don't all agree. Um, the day that all of us in this room agree on everything is the day that I shut this thing down because I'm just not interested in leading a cult unless I get a private jet. So you have to figure out the jet thing and then we can do the cult thing, okay? That's got to happen first. So um, I, I love disagreement and I love dialogue around that, those things. I think a functional religion, a functional faith is when there is conversation and relationship, uh, diversity and opinion. Um, I think that a dysfunctional faith, a dysfunctional religion is one in which there's uniformity um, and where people don't have the freedom or ability to say, I don't agree with that or I don't like that or I'm uncomfortable with that. And so I love being a part of a family of churches and a church where we can talk about these things. So some of you have talked with me this past week about some things that you had some questions about or had some concerns about, and I loved that. And I hope that we continue to do that together. Christianity in its best form is about discovering and extending the grace of God. And, and so if we can't come back to that together, um, uh, even, if, even if we find different ways of getting there, um, that, that's really what we're after. And that's really what this church is about, um, discovering and rediscovering and then extending the sacred, beautiful, um, incredible, life-changing grace that God has given to each one of us and to the rest of the world. So that's what we're in for together, particularly in the book of Jonah. I'm excited to explore that idea with you. Um, I love this time of year because um, throughout the rest of the year or a lot of the year leading up to this point, we spend a lot of time in different seasons of the church calendar. And, and, and what we're doing there is taking an idea or a concept of Christianity and looking at a lot of different biblical texts that support that concept or idea. And I really enjoy that. But I also enjoy this time of year where we typically take a book or a character of the Bible and we zoom in and we focus on it. Um, it requires us to kind of go more verse by verse, idea by idea, and, and it's harder for us to skip around on things, and we really get to drill down deep into some really important stuff. Um, I really enjoy the book of Jonah specifically. Um, I think that it's a unique book in that it's one of the first stories that we learn. Like some of your first memories, if you grew up in church world, are about this story about this guy who gets swallowed by fish. And then as the rest of your life goes, goes on, this book actually gets more and more complicated and more and more debated and more and more weird. And it just, like, it just unfolds over the course of our lives. And I think that's one of the things that makes it really, really enticing my experience with Jonah was growing up was really only on Mission Sundays. I don't know if you've ever had a Mission Sunday at the church you were a part of, but it was the one time a year where the pastor stood up and said, did you know that we have missionaries all over the world? And everyone goes, oh, that's really neat. And then everybody um, says, well, I wonder what else he's going to say. And then the pastor proceeds to read from the book of Jonah and usually use that to either coerce people to be missionaries themselves or to give a lot of money to these missionaries who are out there. That's usually what happens. And then we hear nothing from Jonah after that. That's like it. That's the only time we ever hear from it. That was my experience, at least. Unfortunately, the message of Jonah when it is preached in that context is God is probably calling you to do something that you don't want to do, and disobeying him will be worse than doing the thing that you don't want to do that he's calling you to. That's unfortunately the message of Jonah too often. Probably God's calling you to do something uncomfortable, and you don't want to disobey him because the consequences would be so much worse than just doing the thing that you really don't want to do to begin with. I find that to be extremely problematic for a variety of reasons, most of which I can't go into tonight, some of which I'll go into throughout the rest of the series. Um, but I think that approach to Jonah misses the point of Jonah. Jonah is about God's grace, not obligation. Jonah is about the compelling and overwhelming grace of God to all people, even the most unexpected and the most undeserving and we miss that so often because we get tied up, we get caught up in different elements of the story. 
We get caught up in the historicity of it. We get caught up in some of the literary devices of it. We get caught up with this fish and the fish becomes the thing. And then we miss all these other things because we're focused on this one thing. And there's so much in this book. It's four short chapters and they are very, very rich. Tonight, we're going to be finishing up chapter one, and then next week, we're going to go into chapter two. Phil carried us through uh, three verses, a whole whopping three verses of the book last week, and now I'm going to finish the chapter tonight. Uh, We're going to be in Jonah chapter one, starting in verse four and finishing up in verse 16. It'll be on the screen, or you can pull it up on your phone, whatever's convenient for you. It goes like this. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid and each each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who... Who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I'm a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew that he was running away from the Lord because he'd already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up, throw me into the sea, he replied. It will be calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. They took Jonah, threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In a a story about a bunch of different things, this fish gets a whole lot of attention. And yet, this story about the sailors takes up 21% of the verses in the book of Jonah. So over a fifth of the book of Jonah falls on this story about these particular sailors. I find that really interesting, and I find that it is often missed when we read the story it's a, it's a really interesting act in the story uh, where the storm is raging and getting so bad that this ship threatens to sink to the bottom. The captain is upset and at his wit's end. We know he's at his wit's end because instead of trying to do something to keep the ship from breaking apart, he is now going from crew member to crew member saying, pray, please pray to your God. This would be similar to a airline captain coming out of the cockpit and saying to everyone in the cabin, pray, we're going down. Like this would be about the same thing. We know that captains did not get their, uh, their chops as a captain, did not get their title as a captain unless they had done, paid their dues as a captain. They had probably spent countless days, hours, years, months on the sea. And so we, knew, we know from this text that the storm must have been absolutely wild for him to go from person to person and say, you better pray. Now, it's likely that the captain and everybody else on the ship were pagans, which means they were polytheistic. They had a pantheon of gods that they would call upon. They were decidedly not Hebrew. They were decidedly not monotheistic, which is why the captain said, pray to your God. Okay, so there may have been as many as 70 people on this ship, working on the ship, and all of them would have had what we call um, a patron deity. So a, a deity that they, that they would go to, a go-to god or goddess, The uh, IVP Bible commentary, background commentary says this, patron deities were rarely cosmic deities, so the sailors would not have thought that their personal or family gods had sent the storm. In the polytheistic context of the ancient world, one would generally identify divine activity with confidence, but it was another matter altogether to discover which god was acting and why. The sailors call out to their gods and hope that one of their patron deities might be able to exert some influence on whichever god had become disturbed enough to send the storm. They are calling out for assistance, not in repentance. The more contacts made, the better. So the captain awakes Jonah so that he could call upon his patron deity. Uh, Being uh, a pagan in crisis was a crapshoot. I mean that both figuratively and literally. It's a figurative, in the figurative sense, because it was like everybody calling your patron God, and the odds are we'll dial the right number eventually, and he'll get through to the next guy or whatever, and eventually they'll calm this thing down. 
I mean it literally because they actually cast lots, right? Like they actually roll dice to find out exactly who's responsible for this, and the dice land on Jonah. And they recall at that moment that Jonah had actually already told them, perhaps when he bought his ticket, I'm running away from God. Please get me as far away from Nineveh as you possibly can. And so they go um, to figure out exactly what to do with Jonah at this point. And remember, the wording that they use is, what should we do to you to get this to stop? Because now they've figured it all out. They, they, they've kind of like drawn their line, and they've, they've, they've dumped everything overboard. They're at their wits' end. They've called on all their gods, and they go, it's this guy. What do we got to do to you to figure this thing out? And he says, you got to throw me overboard. That's the only way to do it. Scholars have speculated about what that means. Why did Jonah offer that advice to them? Some, if, and this is a, a reasonable assumption, some have looked at the book of Jonah as a whole and seen the emotional mental state of Jonah and said, he may have just been suicidal. He's terribly depressed throughout the entire book. It's very possible that he was just ready to end it all. Others have said, no, he was noble. He decided he was going to do this in order to save the lives of these people that he didn't even know. What an incredibly noble thing. It may have been... One of those two things, it may have been a combination of the two. It may have been something else entirely. But this is a good opportunity to be reminded of the genre of the book. Regardless of what you think about the historicity of the book of Jonah, the genre of Jonah is comedy. Whereas all the other minor prophets typically fall into the category of tragedy, the book of Jonah was a comedy, a theatrical or a literary comedy in its structure and its context. And one of the characteristics, defining characteristics of a comedy is that there are unexpected and even impossible plot twists along the way. If you can imagine going to a play, for instance, and you're sitting there, and sometime in the first act, the main character throws themselves off the side of a boat, and the curtains close. And you're sitting there thinking, that's the worst play I've ever seen. Like, this was short. I haven't even finished my popcorn. Uh, We just got here. Parking was a pain, whatever. And then all of a sudden... The curtains open again, and act two, this person's now in the belly of a fish. That would have been funny. Like, if it plays out the right way, that's actually pretty comical, and that's exactly how this author tells this story in the form of a theatrical or literary comedy, which is why there's this impossible left turn in the middle of this, bo- of this chapter of the book. The main character throws themselves over the side of a boat. Now our attention is there. Our attention is drawn to this story. If we were falling asleep at any point in this story, our attention is back. And that leads us to, I think, the very point of this particular interaction between Jonah and the sailors. Our attention is, is, is back. We're focused in. And we get to verses 14 and 16. And it says, Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, these are the sailors, do not let us die for, this, for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord have done as you've pleased. Then they took Jonah, threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Seventy-plus men, all pagan, none of them in this crisis calling on the name of Yahweh. Every single one of them calling on the name of another god, any other god, not Yahweh, because he probably wouldn't have been considered a part of whatever pan pantheon they were referring to they they do this one thing actually do something to a child of god and he extends grace to them anyways the raging sea was calmed as a result of their action if there's anybody in this story who is unlikely to receive the grace of god it's these sailors if there's anybody in the story who isn't in a position to receive the grace of god it's these sailors they, 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 don't, they don't really actually call on him until after he calms the sea. They don't actually show any sort of repentance to him until he's actually calmed the sea. They're just trying to do everything they can to save their lives. And in doing so, they, they, well, they do this at the, at the expense of a child of God. See, Jonah would have been the one who had been most likely to receive the grace of God because he had been baptized into the family of God via circumcision. He was a part of the family of God. You would think that God's grace would be to him, but it is actually postponed to chapter 2, and it is in Act 1 that these nameless sailors receive God's grace. The raging sea grew calm. We find, not just in this chapter, but you will find all throughout the book of Jonah, that God extends his grace indiscriminately, He applies his grace to anybody and everybody. God's grace is a wide 
wide net. Even the most unexpected, undeserving, unlikely people seem to be the recipients of it. I know that because I am one of them. And you are one of them. If we think about whether or not we've done anything to really earn the grace of God, the answer is not really. Nothing, I mean, nothing, nothing that would be enough to earn that. Nothing that would be enough to earn that. And yet he extends it to us anyways. Tim Keller says, if you were a hundred times worse than you are, your sins would be no match for his mercy. If you took these sailors and you thought about how far from God they were, how far away, and you were to multiply that even by a hundred, God's grace would still reach them. It would still extend to them. If you think about your life for a moment and think about the things that you've done and the things that you've left undone, and if you multiplied that by a hundred, God would still come after you. He would still extend his grace to you. He would still love you all the same. If you think about someone in your life, you probably all can think of somebody who you feel like is undeserving. Somebody you maybe disagree with, somebody you don't like very much, somebody who uh, you think has the exact opposite perspective on all things than you do. That person, believe it or not, gets the grace of God too because God's grace is big enough, expansive enough to do that. And there's another story in the Bible, if you haven't caught on to this yet, about a bunch of undeserving people receiving God's grace at the expense of one of God's children. We'll get to it in the coming weeks, but um, Jesus, the child of God, the son of God, uh, in in his offering of himself, expends himself, and in doing so, we, undeserving, unlikely people, get to the grace of God. So before we pass judgment on the people around us and, and say that, that those people are disqualified, before we pass judgment on ourselves and say we are disqualified, let us remember the sailors who in this story are perhaps farther from God than anyone else, at least up into this point in the story, and yet God's grace to them is extended because he loves them deeply. He calmed the raging sea, And it was after that that they recognized his deity. They recognized who they were talking to, who they were talking about, who they were interacting with. He extends this grace to them and it overwhelms them. It calms this raging sea that seemed to be completely uncontrollable at that time. God's grace digs deeper, runs faster, climbs higher than any of the stuff that you think makes us disqualified from it. God's grace is not naive or unknowing or immature. It is seasoned. It is aged. It is well-worn. It doesn't balk or hesitate or wait or hold up or reconsider or slow down or pump the brakes. God's grace is lavish. It is gushing. It is unhindered and is unconditional. You get it and I get it and the people sitting to your right and left before you and behind you get that grace too. God loves you. He really, really does. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for loving us despite our uh, inconsistencies and our shortcomings, uh, despite our short-sightedness, even our moments of um, literal or proverbial paganism. God, I, we, you love us all the same and you have extended your grace to us. There's so many things in this story that get us hung up and I pray that we would not miss this thing, this incredible grace that you've given to us extended to us unconditionally. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.